Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks that you gather us here to let us worship you, to let us commune with you and to offer up praise to you and to hear from you. It's a privilege that you've given us. Thank you. And I pray now that you would press into us some, some picture of who you are and of how you work and of how you build us up that, that would benefit us, that would profit us, would lead us towards home in, in ever-increasing maturity. Someone once said that we don't need to know all things, we just need to know a few things and be set on fire by them. I pray you would teach us about that this morning and help us to think about how you press just a few things into us over and over again and move us with them. So Lord, take your word this morning, build your church, honor your name here. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. If, say, you've been a medical professional for any length of time, you probably don't feel the regular need to review Biology 101 or Basic Anatomy. If, maybe if you've been an accountant, it's been a long time since you set aside a morning to kind of brush up on your subtraction and addition skills. For all of us, whatever it is, in all the work that we do inside, outside the home, there's a bunch of stuff, important things that you once struggled with, but then mastered and moved on from. And on the other hand, every professional basketball player still does dribble drills. Every one. Maybe you've seen it. You've been to a game early, you watch warm-ups, you watch on TV. I saw Steph Curry, Steph Curry, before an NBA basketball game, running through dribble drills like he has probably since the third grade. You'd think by now he'd be past dribbling, that he'd, he'd know how to do that. He'd be done. But there he is, tuning up his fingertips, muscle memory, working on it. Okay, so, some things in life you learn and graduate from and never look back at. And yet other things in life you learn and relearn and constantly revisit and reiterate and recall. Two categories. Which one of those two categories describes the things we learn in the Christian life and how we grow? By far, the second category. By far. There is a body of truth that we learn and then constantly revisit and reiterate and remind ourselves of. We put this body of truth, this faith we have obtained, that's the language of, of 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. It, we, we put it on, we take it in, and so we have it. It's in us, but the truth is that we leak. It, it runs out of us. We take it in, but it seeps out, especially if we're under pressure. A soaking wet sponge, if you just pick it up by the corner, the water will run out of it. But if you squeeze it, it'll gush. We walk around in a world under pressure, being squeezed. We have obtained a great faith. We have been saved and equipped and taught, and we leak. So we need to be refilled, always. Which brings us to our passage today in 2 Peter 1. The end of the introduction section, this is verses 12 to 15, the end of this introductory part. And some introduction, some, some endings of introductions work with kind of like building to a pinnacle where then you get some final critical important summary statements. This isn't like that. This is more like we've built to the end and then we like step away from it off the side and look at it from a different angle. And so in some ways, as I was considering this passage and putting together this sermon, I felt this to be actually kind of odd because it's not exactly, this feels to me like not exactly teaching, it's more teaching about teaching. It's a side view of how it is and what 
what's been going on as Peter has been instructing us. But in that, still, there's something for us to learn. It's something that I'm calling the, the ministry of reminding. That's what we're going to consider this morning from verses 12 to 15. Kind of a, a sideways view at what's going on behind the curtain as Peter teaches us. He's reminding us. So let me read these verses, and then we'll turn to two observations. This is 2 Peter 1, verses 12 to 15. Peter writes, Therefore I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them, and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Second Peter 1. So two observations. Here's the first. Christians need to be reminded regularly of the truths of the faith. Christians need to be reminded regularly of the truths of the faith. These four verses contain three statements about bringing something back to mind that is already known. That's the dominant idea here in this passage. But it starts rooted in the previous section. Verse 12 begins with a therefore, which is the summary of, of everything written of the entire book to date. All this, this kind of this very tightly linked teaching he comes to now a conclusion. We have obtained a faith like that of the apostles. We've been saved to know God personally. We've been equipped with power to live the Christian life now for the sake of now and for the sake of that's the path into heaven. So for now and for the sake of the future. That's all true of us and it's very important for God's honor and for our good. So therefore, Peter writes, I intend always to remind you of these qualities better yet, of these things. He's not only talking about the qualities of 5, 6, and 7. He's talking about all the things that he just said as the phrase continues, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. Peter's faithful Christian audience, us, we already know this. We are familiar with these things. We, we, are gr we are grounded in them. We are rooted in them. We know the message of the gospel. We know our equipping and calling. So there's nothing new here. And yet Peter intends to spend the last little bit of time he has left. He knows he's about to die. He says it a couple times. I'm, I'm on my deathbed, perhaps, even. And I think it right that I spend the last little, t little bit of time I have here not telling you something new, but telling you something you already know. That's why I'm writing to you. I'm carrying out the ministry of reminding. It's a really simple point. In fact, like, outside, a bunch of times I'm writing this sermon, I'm a little bit embarrassed. Because everything I'm going to say this morning is like so simple. It's a simple point. The church always needs to be told again what it already knows. That's the good church, the believing church, true Christians, always need to be told again what we already know. Refreshed with them, refilled, because we leak. Now, obviously, he's not talking about how the church like literally forgets these truths and need to have them restated. They don't slip our minds. What happens really is more like they, they dim they fade. We look at them as if it's at dusk and the, the edges are a little blurred and the, the colors faded out of them. There's, there's a lack of clarity. They don't pop. These truths, they, I mean, we kind of know them up here, but they, they fade in importance and they are a bit obscured and maybe even deadened over here. And meanwhile, over here, we walk around in a world that is more than eager to present to us a host of never-ending alternative ideas and they can make it really shiny and bright. 
all kinds of alternative ideas about who we are and how we're made and what we're made for and how we can be satisfied and, and how we could like appeal, it, it, they appeal to how we feel and what we, what we long for and dream of and not just luring but also pressuring because the world can also be full of not just here's the offer but you better take it or else. The fear of what we'll miss out on, the fear of what we'll lose, the fear of persecution, the fear of public rejection. There's alternatives offered and pressures applied, and what runs out of us is this dulling, blurring, hard-to-see truth. That's the world we live in as new creations, equipped with God's Spirit for sure and with so many other blessings, but also hard-pressed and vulnerable and sometimes confused and lonely and tempted and provoked. What we need is not actually to be taken out of the world. Ultimately, that will happen. But what we need is to be empowered to live in the world. We need to be reminded of what we already know. Reminded of the truths of the faith. But not just a factual reminding of the bare truths. Sometimes this is misunderstood, so I think this is worth kind of hovering over for a second. Because Maybe you've heard or been a part of a Bible study or a sermon that leans really heavily into the, the fact that this faith is factual. And that's one of the awesome things about the Christian faith. It's a faith that is factual. We are we are believers of something that is built on propositions, truth statements, that are true about the world and about history, about ourselves. This is a faith that is full of the truth. And sometimes you'll be a part of a sermon or a Bible study or something like that that leans really heavily into that reality. And then what it becomes, what the Bible study becomes, what the sermon becomes, is really nothing more than just a, a restatement of collected truths. Kind of like reading a commentary. This means this, and this means this, and this means this, and this is about that. Let's close in prayer. And sometimes that's done on purpose. Because the belief is that this is a faith of propositions and what people need is they need to know the truth, be told the truth, be reminded of the truth, and then they'll, they'll know it and they'll live it and everything will work out well. The problem is we're deceived. The answer is know the truth. Sometimes you'll, you'll encounter that coming from a pulpit or from a, from a teacher or a leader of some sort. And maybe on the other side, on the flip side of that, maybe you found yourself thinking or saying or you've heard somebody else say as you've listened to truth stated, this is just a bunch of stuff I already know. Why am I here? This is just a bunch of stuff I already know and frankly, it doesn't really change much. It doesn't exactly help me with the alternative offered ideas and the pressure that I'm facing, the temptations. I mean, it's good to know, and I suppose it's, it's good that I know it for Sunday morning, but the rest of the week it doesn't really matter that much. So since I already know it, why go? Maybe you've heard that. Maybe you think that. So sometimes you, you'll, you'll have coming at you, or sometimes you'll find rising up in you this, this idea that the faith is about just truths presented and all I need to do is know them and the bare facts related, that's good enough. That misses something massive. We are not just brains. Or as James K.A. Smith puts it, 
We are not just thinking thingisms. Maybe you didn't coin that. That's where I first encountered that phrase. We are not just thinking thingisms, as if all we need is to know what we're supposed to think, and then we'll think it, and everything will work out. We are more than that. The ministry of reminding that Peter envisions and is carrying out, that God envisions that we actually need, recognizes that we are more than brains. We are not less than brains. Paul writes that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds, our minds. So we are not less than thinkers. We must deal with doctrine. We must deal with logic. We must deal with clear explanation of the truths. This is factual and real. And a bunch of Christians are very weak because they will not engage with the life of the mind. You have to engage with the life of the mind. But we are more than just thinkers. We are more than just brains. If you look at verse 13, Peter says that it's right to spend his last energies doing what? Stirring you up by way of reminder. Reminding of truth that aims to stir you up. That's about emotion. That's about passion. Something in here, not in here, if we can separate like that. By way of reminder, I want to stir you up. I want to move you to believe, to hope in, and to hold tight to these truths. I could tell you to buckle up your seatbelt when riding in a car. And often today in a lot of states, that's actually the law. So I could instruct you with that and say it's a law and maybe you'd do it and maybe you wouldn't. I could also say, buckle up, it's the law, and you might get a ticket, but you also might get in an accident and smack your face against the dashboard or the inside of the windshield. Or if you're going fast enough, actually go through the windshield. And that'd be bad news. That kind of teaching makes a little bit more vivid presentation. I can almost see it. I can almost feel it. Almost. Because, of course, you could follow that with a little bit more. I heard a speaker actually use this exact illustration and then follow it with a little bit more as he recounted a true story from his own family about them going to visit a relative in the hospital who had survived a car wreck but had stuck his head through the windshield. And he said, that made us all believers in seatbelts. I bet. Not the first time they'd heard about seatbelts. Not even the first time that, that they'd connected what seatbelts are for, but, but there was then right in the flesh in front of them a strong and vivid reminder about how good and wise and true and valuable seatbelts are. Clear, connected to a real-life need, right in front of them, vivid. That's the ministry of reminding that we need. Not just the concept of the truth the bare truth told, connected to a real life need and then made vivid in front of us. That's the ministry reminder that Peter, that God, that we are aiming at. So how do we partake of that? It takes us to our second point. We are reminded best by taking in the Bible in the Spirit. We are reminded best by taking in the Bible in the Spirit. Or you could say, 
we are reminded best by being filled with the Bible, filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Bible by the Spirit. These are the two elements, Bible and Spirit. We are reminded best by taking in the Bible in the Spirit. We saw verses 12 and 15 point ahead to the reminding that Peter's going to do of the church after he's gone. I'm always going to remind you, I'm going to make every effort to leave you something so that in the future you can take it and look back at it to recall these things. Specifically, what he's talking about is this letter, this thing that we call 2 Peter. And it's the fitting like next step for somebody who is an apostle. Up in verse 1, he talks about how he's an apostle of Jesus Christ, which in the Bible is an eyewitness of the Lord who was then sent out by God as his ambassador carrying his word to people. And as he's looking at dying, he's saying, here's my word that I have been speaking. Now, write this down and pass it on. And maybe he even dictated it on his deathbed. We're not sure. Pass this on, this apostolic word, so that somebody else will be able to look at it after I'm gone and will know what God says. So he's got this letter in mind. But if we peek ahead at what we're going to look at in coming weeks, in the next couple of verses, he also is talking about, as he calls it, all of the prophetic word. All of it, not just this letter. So he has in view all of the Bible. So really the principle that we're talking about here can, can be applied, extended to the whole Bible, to all of God's word. This book is what we need. It's what we've been given so that we can, now after all these guys are dead, we can look back at it to recall all these things. That by it we would be more than just informed, but transformed this book is what we need so what we should think about is how do I get at this book and we're going to talk about three basic contexts in which we participate and we partake in the ministry of reminding but as I'm doing that I want to like give away the end here at the beginning I'm talking about three basic contexts things that we do but really, ultimately, the ministry of reminder is the ministry of the Spirit. What we do is necessary, but not sufficient. The Spirit of God must remind us. It's God's work. So I'm going to come to that, but that's kind of hovering over all of this as we talk about three basic contexts that we all need if we're going to get at what God gave us to look at and recall with. This is so simple. Part of the difficulty of this sermon is that I anticipated me, on the one hand, feeling a little bit awkward saying these things, and then I anticipated a large number of people saying, like, yeah, yeah, I know that. I know this stuff already. Why am I here? So let me just alert you this is so simple, but it's what God's given to remind you of the things you need. So hear this. I'm going to say it. It's simple, but it's, here it is. The first thing we have to do is read this book. Read it. Like a book or like a letter or like a long email. Start at the beginning Read it to the end, or, or listen to it read, if, if that's better for you, if you take in better that way. But you've got to take it in, and if you can do that in an undistracted way, that's okay too. But read it, beginning to end. Not, not cover to cover, but read it beginning of letter to, be, to end of letter, beginning of book to end of book. Like you would read something that anybody wrote to you. Don't grab a verse over here, a line from the second paragraph, skip over to some other email, read a little bit of that one, and then come back. No. You start at line one and you read all the way to the end. And read it so as to understand it. To try to understand what the author's saying to you. We've all read things, whether it be books or magazine articles or emails, that we were trying to understand and we've all read things that we were trying to get done with. There's a difference. 
Read this to understand it. Which, given it's the Bible, means read it prayerfully, saying, Lord, what's here? Help me to see. Or would you open my eyes that I might behold wonderful things here in your, in your word? And read it thinking. There are any number of Bible reading plans that will get you through the whole Bible in a year at a very doable pace. And many, many generations of Christians, generations of Christians, personally did nothing more than this. They went to church every week. We'll talk about that in a second. But they did nothing more than every day read the Bible and try to understand it. And after you've read the Bible, and I mean the entire Bible, 10 or 20 or 40 times, you understand a lot of it. It shapes you. Because, here's the end given away, the Spirit of God is taking the sword of the Spirit and is piercing you with it to, to bring some conviction or some encouragement to kind of shave off some of the, the rough edges and to to change you. He, the Spirit of God takes the sword of the Spirit and presses it into you as 10, 20, 40 times you read this book. Read it. And second, go to church to hear biblical preaching every week. God has given us the church and God has given to the church, the ministry of teaching and preaching, so that we can be reminded every Sunday with the Bible. And as you do that, you'll hit parts that you aren't currently reading. You'll hit other parts. And that will also help you read better. You get taught things that were the first time confusing to you. You, get, you learn things, and you become a better reader of this book yourself. And you hear it preached to you in, in a, a proclaimed, authoritative, spirit-anointed way. It's different than reading. So go to church and hear preaching and teaching. And lastly then, third context, process this all prayerfully with other Christians in person. In the church body. I have had a lot of conversations with folks and we are, I mean, we're on the tail end of this, of this COVID time and Zoom has become a big deal. But even before Zoom, there was still this kind of movement to have Bible studies and, and connection times with people who live even all across the country. Or in your city, but not in your church. Don't do that. Don't do only that. It doesn't matter if you do that. But what I'm talking about is people that you can sit across the table from who can look at you, who can know you. And can know when you're hiding stuff. And, and can talk through the Bible that you're both reading together, that you're both hearing preached in, in front of you. Can talk that through and can pray about passages and points and, and can discuss what does this mean and how does this apply to our lives. God's design of the body is that together, over the word, with the spirit in our midst, we are reminded of the truth and stirred. Stirred to follow it. So, three contexts. And none of that is very complicated. Of course, we could talk more about Bible study techniques and principles, etc. But realize, most generations of Christians, most of history, didn't know anything about Bible study techniques. They just read the Bible. And they read the Bible and they read the Bible, and they read the Bible, and they read the Bible, and they heard it preached, and they talked about it with one another. And this stuff, by the Spirit, got into them, and got into them, and got into them. That's the process of Christian reminding over the generations. They gathered to hear it taught and preached. They read it, and they discussed it with other Christians. So those three contexts, if we engage with those three contexts, we'll all do a pretty fair job of figuring out what's here. And as we do that, we need to be constantly asking ourselves, of course, what's here? Yeah. Well, so what? What and so what? What's here and what does that say to us? 
What does it mean? This is the important process of connecting what's here to real life situations that I face. The truth connecting to real problems or real longings or real questions in life. Things we meet here in our fallen condition in this fallen world. We're not trying to just ask stuff so that we know it, but we're asking stuff, that's what, okay, now so what? Where does that come to my life? As we do that, it shows what we see again and again is that this faith from God, these truths meet the need and satisfy the longing and answer the questions in beautiful and good and deep and profound, gracious, merciful ways. We find these truths meet the problems of life in gracious and merciful and good ways. We fi- How do we find that? This is the end now. By the ministry of the Spirit. I can't actually make that happen, no matter how I preach. I can't make that happen no matter how closely I read, no matter how consistently I read, no matter how openly and frequently we talk with one another, we can't make that happen. We can intellectually connect, that's the answer to this problem. And we might be left saying, huh, that's interesting. Or we might be left saying, wow, bless the Lord. That's what I need. What a kind and merciful and gracious God who would give that to me. What, what makes that happen? Not me. The Spirit of God makes that happen. Ultimately, the ministry of reminding is the ministry of God's Spirit in us to take these truths that are His sword and to actually apply them, to cut off and defend and encourage wherever needed in each of our lives. These three simple contexts are the places where that happens, and we have to go to those three places. But when we go there, we have to say, actually, there, God help. Otherwise, I've got black ink on a white piece of paper. God help. Make this live. Take me to the hospital room and show me the car accident. Show me where my life is is empty and deceived by all the offers of the world. Show me where the pressures that they are trying to apply to me are actually false and empty. And show me the goodness and the beauty of God. What I'm asking you, Spirit of God, is pour into my heart the love of God. Period. See, that's that's actually where this all kind of comes down to, is the Spirit of God doesn't just pour concepts in. He doesn't pour in truths. He pours in the God of truth. He doesn't pour in just answers. He pours in the answerer. That's what we need. To be reminded not just of concepts, of a person, of a God. Spirit of God, pour into me God. Help. And he'll say, Of course, beloved. That's why I gave you my spirit. That's why I gave you the word. Because I want to pour myself into your heart to reshape you, to renew you on the inside, to cause you to see, to behold the glory of me and the emptiness of the world. Ultimately, the ministry of reminding is the ministry of the Spirit. Ultimately, what we need is the Spirit to fill us Himself and then to fill us with the content of this book. That's God's design for the church. Not once, not done once, but again and again and again and again. What we are as a people is a people who are about the filling of the Spirit and the filling of the book. That's how we grow. I, I think about this, as I said, I, I think about this, this concept here, and, and I just say, intellectually, it's so simple. 
I need a ton more consistency with it. To read, to read, to discuss it with you, to preach it. And over all that, what I need is the Spirit of God to fill me. And that's what you need too. He saved us and equipped us to live now, to live on our way to heaven. And a huge part of that equipping is the Spirit of God with the truth of God constantly pouring it into us that in this truth we would behold the God who stands behind it and gave it for our good, for his glory. Let me pray. Father, would you help us to participate in the ministry of reminder? Would you send us to these three contexts, send us consistently to these three contexts? And would you send us open-handed to your spirit crying out for help? Please do that. Please build your church. Remind us of the things that are true and beautiful and good of the one who stands behind them. In his name we pray, amen.